2. Characters. Me, Gavin. 510, brown hair, blue eyes, glasses, choir nerd. S, another choir nerd, one of my friends. Another victim of our antagonist. Voice that sounds like Sam Smith. Super, our lady beard. 5'5, five five, body shape very strange. Part super thin with parts chubbily hanging down and flabbing about. Donkey teeth, glasses, order like rotten wood. Other minor characters will make an appearance throughout the story. Our story begins on a bus ride home in middle school. In a conversation with an acquaintance about nothing, really. I make a little quip, and we both have a quick laugh. Super makes a beeline up the aisle to the front of the bus from near the middle to plop down in the row behind me. <laughs> I know, right? She comments. Acquaintance and I exchange creeped out looks. She didn't actually butt in on the conversation, but rather she would interject only to agree with one of us or laugh stupidly loud, her breath reeking of something akin to a wet dog. The three of us lived in the same apartment complex, luckily Super being on the opposite side. Fast forward to a couple weeks later. My mother receives a calling in our church to help with the young women's activities, of which Super was a part of. My mother comes home to ask if I know Super, to which I reluctantly reply. My mother is one to never talk ill about someone intentionally, so you could imagine my shock when she says, that girl is off, there's something wrong with her. She then goes on to explain how Super went on and on about how she's so much more mature than all girls her age, to which my mom promptly and politely corrected her and explained to her that that in itself is immature. She stopped talking to my mom for several weeks. Fast forward a bit more. I walk to the bank right next to our apartment complex to use the ATM. Just need to get a couple bucks out. I notice I'm being followed. She was walking about 30 feet behind me. And when I turn around to look back at her, she made no attempt to hide. She just stopped walking when I did and stared. Fast forward to last concert of middle school. She had brought her birth certificate to school to show everyone that Super Duper Pooper was her actual name. That just let everyone know that her parents were as weird as her. Concert comes, we sing Hey Jude from the Beatles, to which my friend who I consider my brother Gecko played guitar. After the concert, Super's dad will call him Pedo. I doubt he actually is, but he has that creepy voice, manic look in his eye, and hangs out around his daughter's friends way too much. Pedo approaches me and cuts me off from my family to plead that I managed to get Gecko to give Super guitar lessons. This was off-putting as, as well as being a ridiculous and absurd request, Gecko was literally standing less than 20 feet away from him. I moved to a neighborhood about 15 miles away, and things died down until high school. First concert with the advanced choir that I'm in, I met S, a junior at the time. We have what is called an ice cream concert. Patrons eat ice cream while we sing. One guy's number, one girl's number, one or two with everyone, with the rest of the time being filled up by our solo up to quartet numbers. Before each concert we have a hype session, to which she would always show up and squeeze into our arm link ring, etc, etc. After that I explained my uncomfortable feelings to S, who sympathised, and informed me he was dealing with her since he was 10 years old. When concert is about to start, she hunts down my dad and starts talking to him. Keep in mind, she has never met my dad. She has no business knowing my dad since my parents are divorced, and he lives in the next city over. My mom and stepdad show up and sit by my dad and start talking before the show, which wards her off. As we start the show, she keeps running side to side in between us and the choir's parents, easily frustrating everyone. Unbeknownst to everyone, she was filming only me and S, and nobody else. She was not in choir. She did not really know anyone in choir, extremely unsettling. Fast forward a little further. I started dating a girl named C. One day, just sitting on the floor talking with C, Super strolls by and looks at us, saying, Oh, it's Gavin! All excited before flipping her hair and turning her back, adding, And that woman! It was around this time that she moved up to my year for unknown reasons and having hit puberty, her breasts were coming in. Annoyingly, she refused to wear bras and insisted on wearing tight shirts, so her dinner plate sized nipples were on display for everyone to see. She overheard me give my number to someone. The first time she called, 
she asked if I could give her a ride to early morning seminary. Here in Utah you can take this religious class as an actual period, which is what I did. Early morning seminary takes place before school. Keep in mind that I am not taking seminary, and that the school is between our neighborhoods, so it's quite literally in the opposite direction from where I go. I tell her no and hang up, wanting to be done. I don't like blocking people because I'm non-confrontational, so to this day, I ignore her number like the plague. During the course of high school, she'd jump on me and hug me extremely inappropriately, and even more so when my girlfriend was around. Even when I had really obvious injuries and was in extreme pain, she didn't stop. This at least gave me an excuse to yell at her as it was incredibly painful, and it acted as a small painkiller and venting option. Then Super's mom enters. Never met her, so I can't give a description. She calls my mom to ask if she can give Super a ride home from school. My mother agrees, being the nice person that she is. The next week, my mother gets an angry phone call, wondering why she didn't pick Super up. Super's mom had apparently wanted my mom to drive Super every day, to which my mom very bluntly said that was ludicrous and ridiculous, and that she will not be doing that. Exit Super's mom. Enter A, a fedora-wearing and leather jacket-in-all-weather person. I met him at about the same time I met S, choir nerd like myself. Despite his outward appearance and bad first impressions, he is a genuinely cool guy. A little weird, but not a bad guy at all. Super starts dating him. Thank God her attention is now away from me, and romantically has been ever since. Eventually they break up because A is very uncomfortable being around her. After the breakup she got a new boyfriend, who she has verbally said she doesn't care about. To make A jealous, she'd photobomb people's prom photos by getting in the background and shoving her tongue down the poor boyfriend's throat. A doesn't care, and is still creeped out. During our advanced choir class, which Super was not a part of, she'd stand outside the door and look in through the windows, staring at A the entire time. Dream Crusher, our nickname for our choir teacher, she's one of the greatest human beings you could ever meet. The only reason we call her Dream Crusher is that she will point out what you're doing wrong and call people out on their BS if she has to. Anyway, Dream Crusher notices this and promptly shoos her away. Super is in choir now, just not the advanced one. Not for lack of trying, but purely because nobody has ever heard her sing a note in tune. Everyone is preparing for choir tour to Oregon. During each rehearsal, Super doesn't grab a chair, but sits on the floor, not practicing, reading a book titled 1000 Ways to Romance or something like that, and I quote, Win A's Heart Back. And that brings us up to date. I've got plenty more details about the BS she's tried to pull, so I may elaborate more on this matter. Hope you enjoyed this story, which boils down to Super being the complete essence of the word uncomfortable. Additional info. She owned a fedora, which she wore pretty often, if y'all were wondering. Three. Hey listeners, I thought I would give you an anthology of beardery, since I don't have any story in depth enough to make a full post. Enjoy. Military beard. So when I was about 14, I interned at a service company for extra credits. It was a nice job and all that. Except that it introduced me to the idea of neckbeards. Meet military beard. He is about six or so years older, pudgy, full neckbeard, and dressed, I shit you not, head to toe, in Soviet military garb. Anyway, we chat with some others about games. He only plays hardcore ones, and makes fun of me for playing The Sims. He, of course, has a weapon collection, which he brags about constantly. Nothing too bad yet, since he had to be professional. Fast forward to present day, and I have a steady friend group, all of which know him. From here on, this is second hand. This odd guy I met when I was 14 has apparently gone even more stereotypical. He is a Nazi, a Stalinist communist, he once cosplayed as an SS officer for a Halloween party, and has a tendency to bring weapons with him. He also hates sex, which does not mesh well with me and my friends. Far as I have heard, he has threatened one of my best friends, Six foot four, probably 200 plus pounds by the way, but usually really friendly. 
he has threatened an entire party of people for discussing sex. He also shot a guy pissing by a tree with a soft air gun, and got his ass beat for that. Simsbeard. Meet Simsbeard. He is pretty integrated in my friend group. Not liked, but tolerated. Most of his beardry is just from being a bit awkward and a bit gross at times. I don't really like him, mostly because he is way too intense, but I hang around him a lot, so I know a lot of his tendencies. He has a tendency to dress in black jackets, even during summertime. A wispy excuse for a beard, and greasy uneven hair, he is surprisingly not a virgin, having lost his virginity to a hooker his dad bought for him for his 18th. A meme in my friend group. He plays The Sims, but far more than I do, and is intensely obsessed with Sony, anime, and Marvel movies. He is one of those guys that brings his old, sticky computer to a cafe, puts on headphones and shuts out everyone else at the table, often piping up with an anime reference or an inappropriate remark. He hasn't done anything bad, per se. This was just an excuse to bring up that he plays Iraj games and watches hentai in public, where anyone can see what he is doing. Bandbeard. This one is a bit different. This guy's had a few girlfriends, he isn't really geeky, just really cringy and a bit creepy. He was also the cousin of my ex who turned out to be even worse than him. We became good friends because we grew up in the same town, liked the same music, and eventually started a band together. I knew he was awkward, but that is generally okay with me, until I saw how he acted around girls. He started hitting on my best friend, bear in mind, she has had a few bad experiences before, so she is wary of people, especially strangers. He started talking down to her about her music taste, tried to kiss and hug her while drunk, and wanted to crash at her place. Though in his words, they wouldn't be sleeping. He also lied about multiple relationships he claimed to have had. Maybe not a neckbeard, but close. There you have it. Unorthodox and messy. But whatever. 4. This is a story about my husband's cousin, Morgan, the only Asian neckbeard I've ever met. No names have been changed. Many years ago, my mother-in-law received a call from one of her sisters who lives in Canada. We are in the US. She asked my mother-in-law lie if her son, Morgan, could come for a visit in a couple of weeks. Apparently, none of his other relatives had space for him. We soon found out why. Lai, after consulting her husband, agreed to the visit. My husband Ricky had never met his cousin, and I was rather curious myself. Two weeks later he arrived, and we finally got a first look at him. Morgan was 18, 5 foot 7, round, soft, but not fat, and a long, bowl haircut. His face was round and pink, and reminded me of the piglet in the movie Babe, but with glasses. He was dressed in a blue button-down shirt, v-neck sweater, vest, cocky pants, and penny loafers. He didn't look like the traditional neckbeard at first glance, but we soon found out that looks can be deceiving. When he came towards me to shake hands, I was hit by a blast of body odor, mixed with the kind of halitosis that could melt wax. My husband actually blanched, discreetly turning his head and covered his nose with his hand. Then Morgan passed him, suppressing my own gag reflex, my eyes watering slightly. I took his hand, it was cold and clammy, and his grip was limp and listless. I felt like I was holding a raw, cold chicken thigh. Ick. I rubbed my hand in my pants, vowing I'd wash it the first chance I got. However, this wasn't the worst part. As we shook hands, he looked me up and down, his eyes settling on my breasts and staying there. At the time, I was 27 or 28, five six, caramel skinned with long red hair, green eyes and about 130 pounds. I am rather well endowed, 38 double D at the time, and am no stranger to guys looking, but this level of blatant ogling really pissed me off. Hey, I said, my face is up here. I added asshole silently to the end of that sentence. Apparently startled, his head snapped up, his eyes wide, as if surprised I'd noticed him staring so openly at my tits. He then smiled, no, leered, and said, Nice to see you. Not nice to meet you, but nice to see you. This annoyed me, but since he was my husband's cousin, I decided to let it go. 
I chalked it up to cultural differences, since Chinese culture, even if it is in Canada, is somewhat different from mine. Boy, was I ever wrong. What followed was two weeks of the most irritating, frustrating, I want to throw you out of the car doing 80 off a 300 foot cliff onto some rocks below time of my life. It quickly became apparent to all of us why nobody wanted Morgan to stay with them. He was spoiled, arrogant, and breathtakingly stupid. Often saying things that were he not my husband's family would have gotten his teeth kicked out and his testicles lodged in his septum. One evening he stated that all black and Hispanic people were stupid and criminals, that men with long hair were low class and unable to get proper jobs, and that people with tattoos were clearly of the lower classes, thus also inferior and unable to get good jobs. Oh, and none of these people could ever make or save money. Ricky and I just looked at him in utter amazement. This was primarily because Ricky at the time had long, thick, lustrous blue-black hair, nearly down to his waist, and happened to own his own successful business. We only lived with his parents out of tradition rather than necessity. And the fact that I am Latina Scottish with half-black siblings from a previous marriage, and have several tattoos on my body, only added to the stupidity of it all. Realising he'd managed to insult both of us, had to explain my lineage, he'd seen my tattoos, he tried backtracking by saying, But you two are the exception, I'm sure. But this wasn't the only thing he did. Oh no. From almost the first day, I noticed that every time I went to take a shower, someone would try to open the bathroom door. Luckily, I always locked it out of habit. I also noticed that whenever I went into my room to change clothes, get ready for bed, or to just relax, Morgan would be lurking nearby. Once I went into my room, and when I turned around to close the door, I saw a beady eye peering at me from the crack. He never did catch me naked. But wait, it gets better. Morgan started asking me questions. And not just any questions, but the kind of questions that guaranteed a reaction. I was sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee when he plopped his butt down across from me. Morgan didn't even start with the usual warm-up questions you'd expect. Oh no, instead he jumped right in. He rapid-fire asked me, Do you have sex with my cousin? Do you enjoy it? Where? How often? And what kind of sex do you have? I admit, I was too surprised at first to react but I'm pretty sure you could have seen steam beginning to come out of my ears and horns erupting from my head. That was it. I was going to kill the little fucker. I guess even people as stupid as he is have some rudimentary survival instinct. Or maybe it was the fangs and claws I was probably sprouting at that moment that gave him a clue. He quickly got out of his chair, backed away, and scuttled out of the kitchen as if his ass were on fire. Might be as nuts if I had my way. I briefly considered going into my room, retrieving the functional tomahawk I'd gotten at a Native American auction from the previous year off the wall, and use it to cave in his skull, or chop his nuts off, but instead decided to go find Ricky and tell him what his cousin had just asked me. To say Ricky was mad is like saying the eruption of Mount St. Helens was a minor event. He came upstairs ready to rip Morgan's head from his neck and drop kick it over the Golden State Bridge. But that was only if I didn't get to him first. When we found him, he was hiding behind Lai, my mother-in-law. Yes, you read right. He hid behind my mother-in-law, who's eight inches shorter. Like a dog who'd just pissed on the rug and knew it was gonna get punished. Morgan looked scared. But not scared enough, in my opinion. Lai had a look of confusion, mixed with mild amusement on her face. Ricky just looked pissed, I'm sure I did too. Ricky and I halted. No way were either of us going to do anything that might hurt or upset her, which sadly included throttling Morgan. I could hear Ricky grinding his teeth beside me, and it was all I could do to keep from going over, grabbing Morgan by his hair and dragging his ass from behind Lai and beat the ever-living crap out of him. Morgan stayed behind Lai, a small, smug smile on his face, the little fucker knew we wouldn't do anything to him while she was there. We all just stood there, Ricky and me giving Morgan the death glare, while he hid behind my mother-in-law, who finally asked what was wrong. Ricky answered her in Cantonese, 
and the look on her face was priceless. She spoke to my husband, then turned to Morgan and said something to him. He lowered his head, but not before I saw the smug little smile that played on his lips and mumbled an insincere apology. I wanted to punch him so bad it hurt. Instead, I made sure never to be alone with Morgan. Mainly because I was afraid of being brought up on charges for throttling the little shitbird. And chose instead to pull out my sharpening stone, cloth and oils, and began sharpening all my knives, swords and axes. I smiled at him while I worked, which wiped that smug little smile right off his tubby face. He avoided me from then on. His visit ended a few days later to everyone's relief. We were all glad to see him go. Especially me and Ricky. Morgan, I hope we never see you again. Five. Now to be clear from the start, I'm a bisexual female. So I'm not making this to scorn the girl's sexuality, but I am scorning how she approached the topic and how creepy she was overall. Characters, me, Pitu, 19. Cosplaying Dark Pit from Kid Icarus, Uprising. Supporting characters, mom and dad, my pretty awesome parents, her, Alice, about 17. Cosplaying a pretty nice Alice in Wonderland outfit her aunt made. Setting, an anime convention I go to every summer. Let us begin. She ran up to me the moment she saw me, beyond excited to see me cosplaying her favorite character. I was personally very excited to meet someone who liked Dark Pit as well. Since I just had a run-in with some nasty dude who scorned me for dressing as said character. Now this girl was very pretty and well kept, unlike many neckbeards you hear about. She was clean too, but her behavior screamed legbeard to the heavens. We hit it off pretty well at the start. She spoke with a fake British accent for her cosplay, which I found admirable and a sign of dedication. After all, I am a cosplaying geek too, however, things were not going to stay well between us. She insisted on calling me Pitu the whole day despite the fact that I told her my real name a few times. When I gave her my number, she made me put my name in as Pitu as well. It only gets weirder from there. We spent more time at the convention together that day, but then she began to comment on how she was fat over and over. I'm a very socially awkward person and an avid runner, so I'm nothing but skin and bones. I didn't know what to say, because she was overweight. And when someone says they're fat and they are, they won't appreciate someone lying to them through their teeth, I think. To this day, I can't tell you how I responded to such comments. Luckily, my dad saves me and says she should accept the body God blessed her with. He's a bit religious, but not in the worst way. However, I now realize she's fishing for me to compliment her. Here's how I know. The day continues, and my dad is off to the side. He's in a wheelchair because he just got hip replacement surgery, while Alice and I wait in line. He suddenly leans in and whispers to me how she's not wearing panties. The woman was wearing a dress, and she wasn't wearing panties. I was beyond disgusted and creeped out, while she clearly thought she was being cute. I soon leave with my dad, planning on wearing another cosplay the next day, in hopes of avoiding her. I tell him what happened on the car ride back to our place. He's both shocked and disgusted. That night, I got some texts from Alice, still calling me Pitu. She apparently stayed for the 18 plus events, despite being underage. Such things would spell disaster for me, so I never go. She proceeds to tell me how some guy is groping her and how the worst part was the fact that she wasn't into dudes. Yeah, not the fact that some dude was supposedly assaulting her. Once again, I'm creeped out, but it also hit me like a bombshell. She was into me and was not so cleverly dropping hints that she was a lesbian in hopes I was too. I didn't reply and told both my parents, who both agreed that I needed to stay away from her. Luckily for me, she didn't recognize me in my other cosplay the next day so I got to enjoy the convention without any more compliment fishing or sexual harassment. But a tip to all people about flirting from a socially awkward girl. 1. Don't call said person by a fake name or a nickname without express consent. 2. Do wear underwear. 3. Don't tell someone that you're a lesbian through the means of claiming a man sexually assaulted you at an event. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Neckbeards in the Wild... Number 9. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use and sent in stories for use in this video. 
This was almost Adventures in Fast Food and Retail today, but I thought, well, what have I got neckbeard-wise? And I had a look and I was like, well, you know, I've actually got enough to do a video. I've actually got a little bit more than I needed to do a video. So I'm already started on the next one, which is good. And I thought, why not? Keep the neckbeard videos going if I can, because they seem to be getting received rather well recently. Okay, I'm going to keep the rest of the outro kind of brief because, uh, well, it's the weekend and I like to keep things brief in the weekend. Uh, plus my throat's a little bit rough today. Uh, feeling a bit better than it was yesterday. I was feeling kind of gunky yesterday, but I'm feeling a bit better today. So, um, uh, well, this is Friday, technically Saturday, five past midnight uh, when I'm recording this. So I'm going to get these videos done. Started a bit later today because uh, I slept in later. I just wanted to make sure I got plenty of rest because I wasn't feeling great. And uh, I'll be resting my, my, my poor little voice over the weekend. Uh, unless I record more of Denver Demon. That's uh, the audiobook project I've been working on. So uh, well, we'll see. But I'll probably just end up resting to make sure I'm good to go on Monday. Okay, and with that I'm heading off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves.